this is your baby flag fen. How did you feel having Time Team land on your site? Well, it was actually a, a very happy experience mm. because I think it was the first time that Time Team moved outside its normal comfort zone. You moved into Flag Fen where we were already working and you fitted in with us. And um, you, you suddenly you became part of, if you like, a, a real excavation. Yes. And um, you know, I, I thought it worked very well. I was very happy with it. Flag Fen is an exceptional site and, and it's very well known because of what was discovered there. And could you just tell us what do you think were the main things that Flag Fen showed people that they might otherwise have not known about? Well, I think the first that Flag Fen showed people is just how well timber wood survives if it's been waterlogged in peat. Um, I don't think people realised, you know, when we pulled out stakes out of the ground, you know, they were massive, they were heavy. Um, and you could see every single axe mark on them. And when you looked at the axe marks closely, you could actually see traces of the nicks that have been on the blades of the Bronze Age axes when they chopped those timbers um, over 3,000 years ago. It was just the sheer state of preservation that completely amazed us when we found the site. And that was... Um, Oh, what was it, 10 years plus before Time Team got there. And it, we, we just never ceased to be amazed. How did you come across that site originally? What sort of alerted you to its potential? The reason we found the site, I found the site, was mm. that, when was it? It was back in 1980 or so. Mm. Um, I was digging uh, a dry site so, you know, more conventional site on the edge of Peterborough. And um, there was a gate which led off the site and just looked over this open, flat fen with nothing in it. And I was looking at, over that gate and thinking, and as I looked out, I could see the jib of a digger out in the middle of the fen. And I thought, hello, what's he doing? Because if he was working out in the wet bin, I knew there'd be good preservation. And um, to cut a long story short, I walked along the dike where that digger had been working, and I found a piece of wood which had been sharpened rather like a pencil with, with you know, clear axe marks, and I recognised that the axe had to be a late Bronze Age axe yeah. about 900 BC. Yeah. And um, it was a sort of, that's it, a eureka moment. Did it ever seem, Francis, I, I remember almost by the second or third day feeling overwhelmed by just the amount of material. And I know that you work very closely um, with Maisie, your partner, who is an expert on preserving this stuff. And I thought, what a, what an amazing amount of material to take on. Because once it's come out of the ground, you have a responsibility to preserve it, which isn't an easy thing to do. No, that's a very good point. Um, the sheer quantity of material um, is staggering. I mean, we're, we're not sure precisely how many posts we revealed in that fence. Um, we, we guess there are probably something like 64,000 out there, and, and um, you know, most of them are still there in the ground. Uh, we got out several thousand. Um, and yes, we can preserve some. Some have been preserved, but it's a very expensive process. But the, the rest have been scrupulously recorded. And one of the things that Maisie did was work out a system for recording how the wood had been split, what sort of tree it came off, you know, what the axe marks looked like on that particular tree. And um, you know, she worked out a system of detailed recording, which is appropriate to waterlogged wood. And it's a system of recording which has been adopted 
well, I mean, across Britain, really. And, and it worked. That's the main thing. Um, and, of course, it's very amenable, you know, nowadays to putting on computers and, and that mm. sort of thing. But it was a, I, I don't mind saying, I mean, talk about a challenge. It really was a challenge. That moment when you were showing us those axe marks, it was somehow like having a set of fingerprints from the past. I mean, we're talking, is this late Bronze Age? Where are we historically here? Yes, we're coming, we're middle Bronze Age, we're coming up to the late Bronze Age. Yeah. So from about 1300 BC um, until about 900 BC, which is the beginning of the late Bronze Age. You know, a long time ago. I've got a feeling that the favourite objects that you favour might more lean towards a large lump of black wood with axe marks on it than something with a bit of bling. Is, is that true? <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, the only exception being a find I made um, on the edge of Flag Pen in a, um, an Iron Age roundhouse where I got a, a loom weight, you know, one of the weights that kept the, kept the, the fibres on the loom stiff. Yeah. And in that loom weight was a thumbprint. Uh -huh. And that person had cut their thumb earlier in the day. And that, that dated to about 1300 BC. Uh -huh. And all the hairs went up on the back of my neck. <laughs> it was almost as amazing a moment as when we got a piece of pottery out of flag fen. Um, this was back in the early 1990s, and um, I realised that there was porridge still in the bowl. <laughs> <laughs> Where does Flag Fen sit in a European context, if you like? Well, within Europe, it's right at the top, really, because you know, not isn't, it isn't just beautifully waterlogged and you know all the woods surviving and the pots surviving and things, but there's you know, hundreds of bronze objects coming from it too, you know, swords, daggers, spears. But when you find them, they've still got their halves with them. Oh. You know, the spear shaft will still be in the socket in the spear. You know, after Flag Fen, there's been the discovery of this extraordinary site about a mile away at Must Farm, which is probably the best preserved prehistoric site ever found in Europe. If anything's better than Flag Fen, it's Must Farm. <laughs> the two sites together and the landscape that unites them, that they're all part of the same landscape, is it's probably the best preserved prehistoric landscape anywhere, anywhere in Europe, if not the world. That's incredible. Are you involved in the Must Farm work? Well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm likely involved as a, as a sort of you know, old man advisor. But it's, it's being run by, by Cambridge University. Wonderful. And a lot of, lot of people who used to work at Flag Fen are working on that project. Yeah. Um, but the thing, the thing about that sort of archaeology is it, 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 it's pan-European. I mean, my knowledge of wetland archaeology uh, didn't come from Britain. I actually had spent some time in Holland. I used to take my team when we were digging other sites, I used to take them across the North Sea to Holland <laughs> to work on Dutch sites because oh. they knew so much and they were so good at it. And so, the great thing about the Dutch is they're so free with handing on information. Yes. You know, they're lovely people. I've got a huge, I'm a huge fan of the Dutch. Yeah. As you remember with time teams, we always yeah. did these reconstruction um, things and I remember going to the end of the, near the end of the film where the, the bronze maker insisted that having made the object and taken the bronze from the earth as it were it was important to make an offering back and and with a great deal of seriousness I think we all bought into that idea because I think the thing that was astonishing for a lot of people who perhaps didn't know that period, was the willingness of people to take rather beautiful objects and in some cases bend them in half or break them and offer them into these black swampy surroundings. And, and has that always been an interest of yours beyond, if you like, the objects themselves? It's the, I suppose it's a kind of ritual thing, isn't it? Well, yes, absolutely. I mean... 
There are certain things you've got to think about in the past. Yeah, we take it for granted that we know what we look like. Yeah, we look in the mirror ten times a day. We see pictures of ourselves, of our friends, and so on. We know every, you know, we say, oh, I've got a pimple coming up on my nose, and you can see it. But you couldn't in prehistory. Yeah, because there weren't any good mirrors in the Bronze Age. And the only way you knew what you looked like was to stand over still water and look into the water mm. and see your reflection. Mm. But when you pass through that water, underwater, you drowned. Yeah. So the water was a symbol of the present you know, and life it, 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 uh, as you were living it, but below it, was a symbol of death. So when people placed brand new, freshly cast bronzes in the water, they were making offerings, they were making presents to the world of their ancestors, their grandfather, or whatever it might be. And it was a very, very special moment. And when I placed that sword into the water at Flag Fen, as we did at the end of our film, mm. I was just holding back tears. I was mm. so emotional. Mm. It was a very, very profound moment for me. I, I won't forget it to this day. And uh, I can remember before we did this scene, the producer said, um, oh, you know, ought you to wear waders? <laughs> and I said, no, I'm going to wear my normal clothes and we're going to get it right in one day. And we did. I mean, you are, well, certainly to a lot of people among the great and good of archaeology. You were a lead person, the head of the CBA, which is uh, one of the most important archaeological organisations. And yeah. of the many things you've done and achieved, what, what do you feel is, is the thing that you hold on to as being the nearest to what you wanted to do, the nearest to your own sense of self, if you like, the thing that mattered? Well, there, there are really two things. The excavations I've done at Flagstaff and so on are terribly important to me. Yeah. But strange as it may seem, I don't look back on my digs as being, you know, the greatest moment in, in my life such as it's been. Yeah. But actually... I regard it as far more important to get archaeology across to uh, the public in general. Because if the people of Britain don't realize why archaeology matters, why prehistory matters, you know, they will just live in the present and their lives will be worthless in many respects. So Time Team is very important to me. And also the books I write. Because when I write my books, I actually have um, a picture of my reader, reader alongside me as I write. I always have faces I'm writing for. Sometimes they're lying on a pillow next to mine. <laughs> Sometimes they're in a train across the across the seat, as it were. You know, I have very particular pictures of people, and what I really love is communicating with people, telling them about and why we mustn't underestimate people in the past. You know, it, it's one of the things that annoys me about politicians in particular, is the way they underestimate the achievements of people in the past. We must learn from the past and not make the same mistakes that they made. Which of your books are you, were you most pleased with at the end? Uh, three books stand out. Um, the uh, what, the first one is Britain BC, yeah, which is you know a, a potted prehistory of Britain before the Romans. Yeah. Uh, the second one is the making of the British landscape, mm -hmm. and the third one I published just last year. Yeah. It's called the Fen. Yeah. And it it's an account of how the Fens formed, how people lived on the Fen. And I've written it for the many people uh, who live in the Fens around me. How do you feel about the future of archaeology? Are you feeling optimistic or pessimistic? I'm feeling optimistic, mm -hmm. particularly 
dare I say it, after COVID-19 coronavirus, mm. um, I think people are going back to basics. I think they are realizing that some of the things that we take for granted, like, for example, globalization, you know, human beings have always lived in culture, in area. Uh, society is about relationships. It's always been based on families, and uh, you can't have this huge, impersonal, trade-based world. You know, there is more to life than just making money. And I think that's one of the things that's coming out of this. And if we're ever going to get on top of climate change, which we've got to do, then we've got to stop jetting around the place like, like brain-dead <laughs> You know, I mean, it's mad <laughs> jetting off to Spain for a holiday. I mean, God's <laughs> Um I'm going to um, go slightly on to another subject. Who was the archaeologist who personally inspired you the most? Have you got a sort of hero from the past of archaeology or indeed the present? Um, oh, gosh, there are so many. But I'm particularly inspired by John Weimer, ah. wonderful man. Yes. Who, you know, who studied the Paleolithic, particularly in Suffolk and elsewhere. Didn't he appear on a time team with us? He did appear on the time team. Yes. Dear old John. Phil talks about. about him very reverentially. He, yeah, he thinks... yeah, but he, <laughs> John's, the great love in John's life, apart from his wife, was Aberdale. <laughs> made in Biggles way. Um, he had very strong views on that. And John and I both shared, shared a love of, of real ale and real flint. It's interesting um, to me that you've picked someone who I would think of as as not he, he's a man of great practicality in his archaeology isn't he he's a he's a he's a tool maker i think he demonstrated yeah. how to shoot an arrow at a deer for us He's a man who brings practicality to his intelligence. Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, and he and Phil were very, very good friends. Yeah. Um, you know, because he was um, pretty much as good a, a flint napper as Phil. Yeah. And they both shared a love of beer and uh, travelled around <laughs> quite a lot. So, yeah, dear old John, he, he was a, a huge influence on me. Sites you would like to have dug on but didn't for various reasons, are there any particular sites that you wish you'd been there? I wouldn't have minded being present when they were exploring Tutankhamun's tomb. Mm -hmm. Largely because that was the book. I actually read Howard Carter's account of Tutankhamun's tomb mm -hmm. when I was still at school, when I was about 16, I was studying for A-level. And it was reading Tutankhamun's tomb. Someone had, I'd been playing soccer, football, and I jumped up to um, head a ball. And another chap had tried heading the ball, and he came down with his mouth open. And he'd taken a great slice out of my forehead. And so for about a, a week or two, I, I, I wasn't allowed to play any games because my that is huge, great bite taken out of my head. And so I thought, I better find something to do. So I went to the school library, and um, uh, a friend of mine there said, oh, why don't you read Howard Carter's Tutankhamun's Tomb? And so I did. And for about a fortnight, I was just wrapped by this book. And it, it, it was that book which got me into archaeology. And I think you. what you've done in making one particular area of archaeology more available to people, more people more aware of wetlands archaeology and what those deposits is a, a, a very unique thing. It, you've sort of taken one area and you've really made something of it. And I think that's a, an amazing contribution to have made. And I, I, I thank you greatly for that and for all the wonderful times we had on Time Team.